We'll transition to our next speaker. So we're also transitioning from a focus on anatomical location for a tumor to, well, if the mutation is present across different tumor types, can we treat that tumor similarly? And this is a new area of investigation. And our next speaker, uh, Dr. David Stenyum, has experience with this. He is an associate professor now. Congratulations on your promotion. Um, he is in the Department of Pharmacy Practice and Pharmaceutical Sciences and a graduate of our program 10 years ago almost. He uh, completed his PGY2 oncology residency and is a board certified oncology pharmacist. His um, research area of focus is in outcomes research and the impact of precision medicine. He has been instrumental in implementing and developing a molecular tumor board here at the University of Minnesota, and he's had prior experience with this at the Huntsman Cancer Institute in Utah, and so Dr. Stenyum will talk to you about that. Great. Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure today to give you a 50,000-foot overview of how we're using comprehensive genomic profiling to identify somatic mutations in solid tumors to help us guide the selection of our targeted therapies in oncology. These are my disclosures, and importantly, I will be discussing potential off-label utilization and also investigational treatments. This is a framework of what I'll be discussing today. I'll be going over the utilization of comprehensive genomic profiling to identify actionable genomic alterations that are, are histology-specific, meaning that they are targeting a certain cancer type, but also some of the new novel alterations that are being identified that we're showing efficacy of our targeted agents that are histology nonspecific or tissue agnostic. These comprehensive genomic profiling um, techniques also identify genomic signatures that help us inform treatment as well. And I'll be talking about the role of microsatellite instability and tumor mutational burden to inform our immunotherapy options, and Dr. Shilpa Gupta will be going into much greater detail about that as well. So I'll start, about, start off talking about our comprehensive genomic profiling techniques. Up until very recently, comprehensive genomic profiling was um, what I would call an esoteric test. It was um, boutique medicine, and there was very highly variable rates of insurance reimbursement. So this was only for select patients and select cancer types where there were therapeutic indications. And this is a technique where we obtain a piece of the tumor and do a very broad sequencing, looking for somatic mutations and also genomic signatures within that tumor. And then we can use our targeted armamentarium of therapies, either on-label or off-label, to potentially target that, the drivers, the molecular drivers of that tumor. Recently, in the fall, the FDA approved Foundation Medicine's um, comprehensive genomic profiling test and also announced that a CMS coverage decision was forthcoming, which we did receive um, an announcement in May of this year um, announcing the coverage decision. And with this, there has been articles proclaiming that now precision medicine is going mainstream and that genomic profiling should be offered to all patients. So this is the FDA approval announcing um, that this test has been FDA approved, and this is the CMS coverage decision for next generation based sequencing tests that are herald to ensure access to um, this type of technique for advanced cancer patients. In the coverage decision, the language is actually quite um, vague. For patients, they describe just advanced cancer patients through, that have previously not been tested for that exact same cancer, but importantly, too, they must be willing to have treatment. However, for reimbursement issues, this will be very difficult to enforce uh, and validate. Also, based on the assay, uh, they have some characteristics for this assay in that they have to have an FDA approval or clearance as a companion diagnostic and it should be FDA-approved or cleared um, indication in that patient's cancer type. And up until the last few years, this would have been a major impediment for utilization in these different cancer types because only a small percentage of cancers actually have companion diagnostic tests. So this would be an example like in melanoma where you have V600E alteration that predicts response to a targeted agent, a BRAF inhibitor, for example. However, now as I'll discuss in upcoming slides, we have pan-tumor indications where the indication for the therapy is based solely just on a, gen a genomic alteration or molecular signature, which is present in uniformly across many different cancer types, which opens up this testing now to uh, essentially all advanced cancer patients. 
They also recommend that these tests provide um, very discrete information about specific um, treatment recommendations. So this coverage decision has really opened up the doors to precision oncology um, and has made this now available to most cancer patients. This is a list by my account of the FDA approved NGS tests. So we, there are two what I would call comprehensive genomic um, tests available that are FDA approved. This is Memorial Sloan Kettering's impact assay and now Foundation Medicine's F1 CDX test. The other panels that are approved are either looking at specific alterations or indicated in specific cancer types, whether it's non-small cell lung cancer or colorectal cancer. However, um, with these two FDA approvals of the comprehensive genomic profiling tests, um, really opens the door for utilization for these cancer patients. So next I'm going to go over how we identify and utilize this information to identify actionable genomic alterations. And this is based upon the principles and the hallmarks of cancer where we're trying to identify the key molecular drivers of these different cancer types, either through their ability to sustain life-promoting signals or to evade apoptosis, evade immune destruction, and so forth. But it's through the identification of these individual um, alterations that we can then use our targeted therapies. But this is more easily said than done. In precision oncology, what you're looking at here is a histogram of a broad swath of, of patients with a variety of different cancer types and looking at the frequency of genomic alterations that were actually identified. And what you can see, and it's not important to recognize what the actual genomic alterations are, but it's the shape of this curve. And as you can see, the frequency of these alterations is actually quite rare, and they're not very common within individual cancer types. And most alterations are present actually in less than 2% of these different individual tumors which makes drug development um, extremely difficult and also in recruitment to these clinical trials very hard when you're trying to target one particular alteration. So this actually can be quite challenging. However, the pharmaceutical industry has done a phenomenal job. This is an account of all the FDA-approved targeted therapies through 2018. And since 2006, we've had 31 targeted FDA-approved agents for 38 different indications. So this is a tremendous advance in targeted precision oncology through the development of these therapeutic agents. So this is great. We have 31 new uh, oncology drugs that we can use with targeted indications. However, looking at the number of eligible patients that are actually um, could go on to these therapies based on these genomic indications, in 2006, this was only 5% of our cancer patients. So a relatively small number of cancer patients would actually be eligible for this treatment. This number has increased. It's increased by over 50%. So now today in 2018, 8% of our patients would be eligible for an FDA-approved drug based on a genomic alteration. But we still have a long ways to go. This leaves over 90% of patients um, without a, a targetable drug um, specific, specifically for a genetic alteration. But what keeps us excited is that the response rates in patients that do go on these therapies are actually quite good. So the median response for these therapies is 54%. Um, so meaning that in 54% of patients, these tumors shrink by at least 30%, which is a meaningful um, response in oncology. And importantly, this duration of response is quite good. So in advanced cancer patients, these patients are living almost three years with this one therapy. Keep in mind, these data are um, extremely biased by a few agents that have really profound efficacy results. So this includes the BCR able tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and this also includes um, the MSI high patients that are treated with, uh, with the immune therapies, which have um, some very profound and durable responses, but still gives us hope that these agents can now be expanded to, um, to, different, to additional individuals. So I thought it'd be interesting to kind of walk through one of the poster childs um, for precision oncology, and that, is on, and that is lung cancer. And this did not reproduce well. I apologize for the blurriness of, of this figure. But historically, in the past, we've broken down lung cancers based on how they look at underneath the microscope. So it's the morphology of the cells. Is it a small cell or is it a non-small cell lung cancer? And then it's further categorized based on the histology. What, what, where are these tissues, um, what is their tissue of origin? Is it a squamous cell? Is it a glandular structure making it adenocarcinoma? And that's where we stood for a long time in oncology, just based on those uh, histological diagnoses. 
today and in the, in the last 15 years, we have been, been able to do sequential testing for a couple different alterations in lung cancer, and that was EGFR and also ELK. And these were typically done through sequential tests looking at first EGFR, which is more common in lung cancers, and if that was absent, then we'd look for ELK alterations, which are more rare, and these alterations tend not to have co-occur. And it was there for quite some time. We were just looking for those two alterations. Well, today, with comprehensive genomic profiling, we were actually able to look for those two alterations on the same panel, but also look for a broad range of up to 300 to 400 different genes at the same time, which may have therapeutic implications. And since this was published in 2017, where this is saying is upcoming, now today this is truly at the forefront and, and standard of care to do comprehensive genomic pro profiling in lung cancer. And even since this, this was published, we have ROS1 inhibitors that have been FDA approved. We have now BRAF inhibitors that are FDA approved for, for lung cancer. And I'll show you data today as well on um, RET inhibitors and TREK, in, and TREK inhibitors that are also at the forefront and will receive FDA approval very shortly. So this is now common and it is standard of care practice to employ a precision medicine approach in lung cancer. And now we have a truly a molecular classification of this disease. Instead of talking about adenocarcinoma of the lung, we talk about elk mutated um, adenocarcinoma of the lung or EGFR mutated um, lung cancer. And today, 25%, approximately 25% of uh, lung cancer patients are eligible for FDA approved or emerging therapies um, that are targeted. So a very large percentage of these patients will actually have a precision approach and utilize those therapies. But what's more striking to me is the number of biomarkers and drugs that are in clinical development that these patients are potentially eligible for. So an additional 50% of patients could have an experimental approach and have uh, biomarkers or drugs in development that would be applicable for them. However, still 25% of patients with lung cancer do not have any mutations that we know we can target today with either FDA-approved drugs or through experimental therapeutics. So how are we implementing this in the clinic, especially with these novel biomarkers that are emerging where we don't have FDA-approved drugs or we do not have um, guidelines for recommendation? So it's actually quite easy. If we do have an FDA approval, we match the molecular alteration with the cancer type and with the drug therapy. This is not really what we're talking about today. We're talking about um, the alterations that we identify that do not have FDA approvals. And in the introduction, Dr. Kirstein mentioned that we've made efforts here at the University of Minnesota to form a molecular tumor board, and we have mem several members in the audience today. And this is a multidisciplinary group that reviews these comprehensive genoma profiling results, tries to interpret the, the information that's provided with the, and then synthesize the data that's available in the literature to provide the best recommendation for these patients, whether ideally it's a clinical trial or it's a off, potential off-label utilization based on um, some compelling preclinical and clinical data. And ideally, we try to uh, recruit patients to clinical trials um, to, uh, to demonstrate the evidence of, of this approach. So as Dr. Yi mentioned, the clinical trials in precision oncology have had to adapt as fast as the number of agents have been growing in this area as well. And two different approaches um, to clinical trials have developed. One is a basket-style approach, and the other is an umbrella-style um, design. In a basket-style approach, um, Instead of separating patients based on the particular cancer type, we separate patients first based on the molecular alterations that are present in their tumor, and then treat all those patients with that specific alteration, regardless of their cancer type, with a specific agent that is targeting that drug. And you can see several different trials that are currently ongoing um, in the United States and uh, elsewhere um, utilizing this basket-style approach to try to increase uh, recruitment to these clinical trials based solely on the genetic alteration. We have umbrella trials as well, but umbrella tri trials focus first on the cancer type and then look at the different alterations, so it's more cancer type specific than these ba the basket style approaches. Also, different levels of evidence and different frameworks for evaluating the levels of evidence have emerged. So most of you here in the audience today are probably familiar with FARM GKB. Well, in oncology, a, a new database or knowledge database has, a, has been developed, and this is OncoKB. This comes out of Memorial Sloan Kettering, and it has different levels of evidence, and I'll make this a little bit bigger so it's easier for everybody to look at. 
Level one is a federally FDA recognized biomarker that's predictive to response with an FDA approved drug in that indication. So this is the high, highest level of, of evidence that we have. As you can see, as we go down these level of evidence, we, we lose um, either FDA approval or indications in the particular cancer type and, or we're going more based on preclinical data. And in this um, algorithm, we do have negative levels, and this is for resistance mechanisms that predict um, lack of response to therapies. An example of this would be in, in colon cancer with a, with a um, KRAS alteration predicting lack of response to their EGFR targeted monoclonal antibodies. So this is a, a framework of how this would actually look. So in, with, for the gene that's identified in BRAF with an alteration, for example, in the B600E, we do have now two FDA approved indications um, targeting this V600E alteration. One is in melanoma, so it receives a high level of evidence. And since this was um, published, we actually have the same um, FDA approved indication in lung cancer as well. But in other cancer types, we have um, less evidence and no FDA approved indications. So you can see in bladder cancer, we have a 2B recommendation here saying there may be some evidence, um, but it's not commonly used um, for bladder cancer. So Memorial Sloan Kettering has um, done a, a comprehensive analysis of the patients that they have um, comprehensive genomically profiled in their institution. And this is the frequencies of level of evidence that is identified across here 16 different cancer types. And what you can see here is in green is the level one evidence. And as you can see, it's not very common to find level one um, genomic alterations that are present. So remember I showed you at best we have 10% of patients, cancer patients, that could potentially be eligible for a level one recommendation. But what should be striking to you is the number of patients um, in a variety of cancers that have um, actually genomic alterations that have varying degrees of evidence for utilization of our targeted therapies. And this is different based on what cancer types you have. Some cancer types have more genomic alterations um, than others. And as um, Dr. Yi mentioned, breast cancer has two that are commonly used with the, with the ER alterations and also HER2 mutations. Um, but in other cancers such as melanoma, th um, thyroid cancer, and so forth, there's many more alterations that have potentially actionable alterations. And in this histogram, we're looking at the, the total number of actional mutations per sample that is tested. And in this analysis, 41% of patients across these variety of tumors actually had an actionable alteration regardless of that level of evidence. So remember I told you about 10, only 10% 10 of patients have an, a level one evidence um, recommendation, but now if we look at varying degrees of level of, of recommendation, 41% of patients could potentially um, be eligible for a precision medicine approach and have therapies that are um, potentially targeted. So this expands our patient population. So let me give you a, a broad overview of some of these um, actionable genomic alterations and the impact that this is having in a, in a couple different cancer types. So the first I want to talk about is a actually tissue agnostic um, FDA approval. So this was the first approval in oncology that was independent of the actual cancer type and solely based on a molecular signature. And this was in uh, the absence of DNA mismatch repair enzymes. And in, in patients that lack these enzymes, they have a formation of multitude of different alterations that occur in these actual cancer types. This can be either in germline alterations, but also in somatic, muta in somatic mutations as well. This is a common in a, a variety of different cancers, but it also um, does appear in a, in a multitude of different cancers. Um, this is fairly rare if you look at all cancer types. It's only present in about 4% of, of different cancer types. But this is then potentially eligible for 60,000 patients here in the United States alone, just based on this mismatch repair deficiency. So pembrolizumab was um, one of the first to study um, the response of this immune therapy. So the concept here is the more foreign that tumor looks with the more al genetic alterations that are present, these immune targeting agents have a better likelihood of response. So the immune system is more able to, to identify that tumor as, as foreign and then attack that tumor. 
And what is shown here is, is what's called the waterfall plot. And this is plotting the percent change from baseline of that tumor and how much that tumor either grows or shrinks. And if you're below the line of unity here of zero, it's meaning that tumor is shrinking. And what is striking here is the different colors of bars are the different cancer types that were studied. And we saw responses in all the cancer types that were studied. And importantly, the majority of patients here um, had a response to this therapy. So 53% of patients, those tumors shrunk by 30%. And in 21% of patients, those tumors actually um, completely disappeared. So they were gone. And so that is a, just a phenomenal response in, uh, with this agent, this immune therapy, in this very highly subset of patients with DNA mismatch repair deficiencies. However, based on this um, technique and identifying this DNA mismatch repair enzyme, other genomic signatures have started to emerge as well. And one of those genomic signatures is tumor mutational burden. And again, this is how many mutations are present in a patient's tumor sample. And that correlates, again, with response to immune therapy. And I'll show you that data here in a second. So 7.1% of all cancers have what would be considered a high tum tumor mutational burden. And this correlates very closely with this um, DNA mismatch repair deficiency, which is also termed MSI high. So 85% of these tumors um, have both high tumor mutational burden and also are considered MSI high. However, the converse is not true. So if you look at this diagram, there's a large percentage of patients that have high tumor mutational burden but don't have um, mismatch repair deficiencies which opens the door for applicability of using this genomic signature for more patients. Um, Dr. Gupta will talk about another um, biomarker, and that is PDL1 expression. And this is not identified through comprehensive genomic profiling, but these are immunohistochemistry techniques that also are identifying additional responders and additional subset of patients as well that may be able to tailor this therapy to an additional subset of patients that will respond. So this is some data that was recently published in February of this year in lung cancer. And this is, this is a subset of patients with high tumor mutational burden identified as patients that have 10 mutations per megabase of DNA. And you can see the intervention arm here was um, combination immune therapy with nivolumab plus ipilimumab and in comparison to chemotherapy. And in these are progression-free survival Kaplan-Meier curves, and you can see the, the combination immune therapy had substantial benefit over chemotherapy in this high tumor mutational burden subgroup. However, if you look at the low tumor mutational burden group, the difference was not as pronounced. Uh, there was still a benefit, but it did not reach statistical difference, highlighting the importance of looking at tumor mutational burden for selection of, of patients that may respond favorably to these very expensive immunotherapy options, in particular the combination of Nevo and Ipilimumab. So these immune therapy agents were the, were the first to have a tissue agnostic um, FDA approval. And in the future here, we're going to see um, at least two others in the very soon future. So truck fusions are a, a new alteration that's uh, being identified in a variety of different cancer types, both in pediatric patients and also in adult patients. And you can see here the variety of different cancer types that um, actually have these truck alterations, but they're exquisitely rare. They're only present in, they're present in less than 1% of these individual cancer types, and only affects up to um, 5,000 patients per year may actually harbor these alterations in the United States. However, we have a, um, a very potent agent called larotrectinib that was, has recently demonstrated um, a very high overall response rate. So in patients harboring these TREC translocations, irregardless of what that translocation was and what cancer type they had, there was a 75% overall response rate. And this is a truly remarkable result in oncology to have such a high response rate. So three-fourths of patients that went on this drug had a very meaningful response. Again, this is a waterfall plot showing the mean changes in their tumor, and you can see the very high rate of complete responses, meaning these tumors completely disappeared. And importantly, 71% of these responses were ongoing at one year, and almost all of these patients are still on this therapy today. And in oncology, as you know, many of our drugs have very severe and toxic side effects. This therapy, there was no grade three or four related AEs to this therapy, and all the adverse events were mostly grade one. So they were very easy to tolerate. So hopefully most of you are not squeamish. This is a, a sequitory breast cancer example. And you can see this very large tumor mass that was actually protruding from this young individual. 
um, that had been treated with multiple lines of, of treatment. Here, this is the tumor at baseline, and this patient was treated actually under an expanded use, compassionate use protocol for, with larotrectinib. And you can see after only six days of treatment with larotrectinib, that tumor shrunk by over 50%. And after, after 20 days on therapy, less than three weeks, that tumor is almost completely resolved. So clearly a, a remarkable advance in treatment of a very rare alteration. Um, but fortunately now we have a, um, a very effective agent. And this agent should be FDA approved um, later this um, coming year, and it's slated for approval in the fall. Another alteration that is quite rare in many um, different cancer types is, is RET alterations, whether they're RET fusions or RET mutations. And you can see these fusions are present in some very common cancers, like lung cancer, but also present in some rare cancers, such as um, papillary thyroid cancers. And these RET mutations are present in another form of thyroid cancer called medullary thyroid. Um, and these alterations are extremely rare, so less, per, less than 1% of these cancer types actually have these alterations present. And again, we have a new agent that is targeting this uh, RET alterations, whether it's the fusions or the mutations. And these are results that were just presented at ASCO um, earlier this month. And you can see, again, um, in these RET fusion positive cancers, a 77% overall response rate. So truly remarkable activity in these RET alterations. In the RET mutant thyroid cancers, the response rate wasn't quite as good, but still almost 50% of patients are responding to this therapy, and these responses are actually ongoing, meaning that these are durable. This agent even crosses the blood-brain barrier, and so this patient here, and in three patients in this study who had um, intracranial lesions, you can see um, complete disappearance of those intracranial lesions within a month of treatment, um, which, which provided significant impact in their symptomology um, as well. So in conclusion, we've seen a profound transformation in the management of aggressive or advanced cancers through the now the utilization of comprehensive genomic profiling to help dictate therapy. This is still only applicable to a small percentage of patients that can actually go on to FDA-approved agents, but I hopefully I've impressed upon you that now this is being implemented and utilized and thought about in, in more patients. And up to 41% of patients, there actually is potentially a targetable alteration that we can use either FDA-approved drugs off-label or ideally through, through clinical trials. But this poses many new challenges. So patient expectations. So many patients now are seeing billboards, they're seeing um, commercials on TV about precision medicine, but we have to keep those expectations aligned with our, our current understanding and benefit to these patients. Also, with the rapidly growing information of these molecular alterations and their impact, clinician understanding, integration, and implementation in the clinic is, is, is quite a challenge, especially in community centers and rural um, centers where they don't have necessarily the luxury of um, a molecular tumor board. Didn't talk about this concept um, in great detail, but tumor heterogeneity and evolution is an important concept. We know these tumors are not static, and the FDA approval um, for comprehensive genomic profiling says they can only have one test. But we know after patients fail therapies that genetic landscape changes over time and new alterations may, may develop. So we'll have to navigate that changing landscape as well. Also, as I mentioned, treatment and access will be an issue. I discussed potential off-label utilization. How do we reimburse and provide evidence for benefit um, in this um, potential off-label utilization? And these payment and reimbursement models will potentially have to adapt as well to this new changing paradigm for precision oncology. With that, I thank you for your attention and I uh, take any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Stenyum. Uh, we have time, I think, for one question. Um, hello, I'm Claire from uh, Fair State University in Michigan, and just wondered if you could speak a little bit to the Molecular Tumor Board. We have one at our clinic, and it's run by one of the Foundation One, but I'm still trying to figure out kind of what our role is as a pharmacist, because, you know, you don't have a lot of input when it's done kind of by, via telemedicine. Sure. Um, there's many different approaches to take from molecular tumor boards. Um, the approach we've taken here at the University of Minnesota is to have a, it's essentially a consult service where clin clinicians can submit a patient's um, 
genomic profiling results to our board to review. And as I mentioned, we are a multidisciplinary group with pharmacy involvement, but also driven through um, medical oncology, pathology, radiology, surgical, um, surgical oncology, and, and ideally in the future, we're also going to add in genetic counseling as well. And so the approach that we've taken here is to then um, to review each individual case and provide therapeutic recommendations based on the collective group and experience. So myself, um, I can talk about my... The, the, the role of the pharmacist in this um, is to really critically evaluate what would be the benefit of an individual therapy um, for, for that cancer patient based on those genomic results. So it's digging into the literature, looking at clinical trials that have potentially been done in that area, and trying to extrapolate that potentially to the patient's cancer. Um, we also can then be very influential in how do we actually uh, procure those drugs or to recruit patients to potential clinical trials. So it's trying to identify, um, even though we can find a therapy that may be beneficial in this patient, how do we actually obtain that therapy for them? And with some of the new um, regulations and mandates for potential compassionate use protocols and mandates to allow pharmaceutical companies to offer compassionate use protocols, um, this is another avenue that pharmacists can play in writing those protocols and getting patients on these experimental therapeutics um, that would be covered through the pharmaceutical company as well. So um, we really need to be integral components of this team and provide our expertise in, in the pharmacology of these agents and how they may interplay with their other um, medications and how they may... They the impact of and on their current treatment. So, does that answer your question? Great. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Stenyan.